Wow, there's a lot of people here. Hi all, hi all, how are you all doing? Um, this is the business of development talk. Uh, I come here more as a representative really of real Mac software rather than Pixar. Um, <clears throat> so this is not really a Pixar endorsed talk, this is actually a talk I gave uh, a couple of years ago here. Um, this talk is kind of geared towards you if you are, well, thinking about coding professionally rather than as a hobby. A lot of the stuff will suddenly apply if you, know, you just want to do coding and make games or make programs as something on the side. But this is really about you know, if, if you are making, trying to make money from your software, then what are things you can do to try and help you do that? Uh, of course, some of it will apply too if you just do stuff for yourself. But yeah, so with that, let's start. Um, this is the uh, awesome sync thing for Tony. So Tony, when you're looking at this, then the beep, you should hear it on the two. Wow. You <laughs> okay, hopefully that came through. Um, no, and that's called the Academy header for people in the industry who, or if you want to like sound impressive when you talk to your friends later. Um, so yes, now the talk actually starts. Um, so this talk was actually written a couple of years ago, and I went through it, um, you know, this morning or last night, and thought, well, maybe I should update a couple of things. But it's actually kind of cool going back and looking at all the stuff and seeing what what was hip and awesome in 2008 versus now. Um, so you may recognize some of the icons there. Um, the respective programs are Trism, Delicious Library, and Rapid Weaver. Um, and the question is, well, well, how much money did they make when they were first announced? Um, Delicious Library, which is on the Mac, sold $250,000 in its first month. Um, Prism did about the same on the iPhone. Um, and now, you know, you guys are in the industry enough that you know kind of what the figures are like for the top-selling games and all that. I, you know, the Apple, um, Apple folks make it fairly easy to make pretty good guess as to how much money these things are making. Um, but at the time, especially in 2008, um, people didn't really well, 2006, especially when I started on it, people didn't really quite understand how much money was in Mac software. Um, so I joined this outfit called Real Mac Software and worked on this program called Rapid Weaver. I actually got into it because I wrote a plugin for it because I, I liked uh, Rapid Weaver and I did pretty unholy things and with undocumented APIs and using you know code injection and stuff to try and get the plugin to work. Um, and they were impressed enough with that that you know they thought, hey, do you want to come work on the program? I said, said, yeah, sure. And I had no idea that this one program was basically sustaining a company of, uh, at the time it was four or five people, and now it's like seven or eight. Uh, and still mostly, I think, all from, from Rapid Weaver. Um, obviously, Real Mac have many other products now too, and they branched out. But um, it's pretty impressive that there's one little Mac company that produced this program as its core thing for, for up until a couple of years ago. Um, sustained it enough that they could actually employ like seven people. You know, the UK is not really a cheap place to live, and they're all in Brighton over there, so they did pretty well. Uh, so I don't actually have figures on that. Uh, I, if I could, I probably couldn't tell you anyway. But it's doing okay, right? So this is the kind of market that we're that we're dealing with. Um, I don't want to talk about you turning into this guy, right? You're, we're all engineers. We're, we're coders here. We're not business people. Um, you might be both, and I'm sure a lot of you are great at both, but deep down, you know, I think you still think of yourself as a programmer. Um, so, you know, don't, you probably don't want to be this guy anyway, since we're all in the mindset of, you know, we're in this, like, true art form and we're producing software for, for people. Um, it's not just about moving money around in the world. But you are, as a coder, you're part of the, the you know, you're part of a team, and um, the goal of this is to try and make sure that you're, you can be a really effective part of the team and contribute kind of more than your fair share. And again, like the Pixar talk, it's kind of the more, um, uh, by being part of it uh, and being all together, you actually are working better than if you were just working by, by yourselves. Um, so you're kind of this guy, right? Except you look more like that, that's all, right? But uh, the goal here is to try and make you up with 200% rather than you know 80% when you're joined up with everybody else. Um, so the context of this talk is really uh, experiences I had with both CineSync and, and Rapid Weaver. Um, CineSync was an, is an interesting case study since it's doing, it really took over the industry. It, it is, there are no competitors for it and, uh, and for what it does. Um, and Rapid Weaver was my introduction to Mac software. 
Um, so really, I think the goal in all this is to try and build up something that's sustainable. You want, you want growth, and you want steady growth, and you don't, you know, the spikes and stuff are, are great, but what you really want is to just keep on building up some momentum so that you're stable, right? Uh, sustainability is a, a really important thing. Um, and I, you know, there's a lot of great ideas and great products from people, and you know, maybe they, they are really nice and they price it too low, or they don't do the support well enough, but eventually, you know, I don't think you can run with that for more than a year or two. It just becomes really, really hard. So um, all, all the stuff I'm talking about is trying to make your product um, more sustainable, which mostly for the stuff that we produce means stuff that's easier to support, because support tends to be the thing that kills you. Right? You spend way too many hours in a day doing that than developing new stuff. Um, the good news is, is that most of these goals um, that I'm talking about today, you, can, you know about all this already. Good coding practices go a really, really long way to directly impacting the bottom line and the business. Um, you, know, you all know about software development, you know, agile methodologies, and you all know about project management things like track, that, um, you know, revision control systems, um, daily builds, and you know about stuff like refactoring to keep your code clean all the time. And people tell you about this stuff all the time. Right? Just fine, just, keep, just, do, just do it. You don't actually need to know that much else. If you are adopting all these practices, you're already in a pretty good place, and you're better than a lot of the industry already. So if you're doing all that, that's already good. Um, well, let's talk about a little about each one in a little bit more depth. So the first one um, is revision control systems. You know, people have these big flame wars about is Git better or Mercurial better or so, you know, Subversion is like the most universal client, all this kind of crap. It doesn't really matter. Just pick one and run with it. It's going to be a lot better than not using anything. Um, if you're basically a company of geeks, then sure, use Git. That's fine. Uh, if you are cross-platform, you still don't really have much choice other than Subversion um, if you want to keep it friendly for uh, non-coders. But, you know, maybe they're willing to learn command lines and stuff. And just pick one and run with it. Right. It's a lot better than, ha than having none. Um, so one thing that's actually really great for the bottom line is to do nightly builds. Um, this is obviously good coding practice, um, but the great thing about night nightly builds is that it makes sure that your trunk, or you know, whatever, or your head, or whatever you call it in your revision control system, um, it makes sure that code compiles and works. Right? If that build breaks, that's not good. Right? The WebKit team has been doing this for a really, really long time. Um, and the reason why you want to do this for, from a business perspective is that um, it allows you to be a lot more flexible and you can ship stuff a lot faster. If you discover some, some really bad security bug um, or you discover you know, some really other really critical bug, this allows you to react much faster. If you c always keep the head of your project um, as something that builds and something that works, it doesn't matter what development you're doing on it. You know, you can instantly ship out a product in a couple of hours. Ideally, you actually want to deploy directly from your nightly build into you know whatever the website releases are, which requires a lot more scripting and automation. But um, in the end, it's it's a painful thing to set up. But once you do, you kind of never have to do it again. So try and get it done. It allows you to move 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 much faster and react much faster. And we've got you know, Rapid Weaver had a couple of major bugs in some releases and by making sure that the head was always the thing that we shipped. Um, we never really got caught out too badly by that. So if you're not using a bug tracker, it's probably the single most important thing, not just for you know, your own sanity, but also uh, to show that, to, so that it's more of a communication thing so that other people can track that progress is going OK. You know, manage, if you are working by yourself, then you are kind of your product manager. Um, but if you are working with even just one other person and, you know, you, uh, and they kind of control the product and they're the manager of it, that allows them to check up on, on how things are going with the product and they don't have to waste your time by asking you and you don't have to go um and ah make up excuses, right? This is all part of just the daily. It's really a communication tool. Um, I'd recommend Track. Um, it's been around for a while. Um, there's you know, much newer solutions and stuff around now, but I still use it. It's got great integration with Subversion, um, and it gives you a couple of really nice features, like the RSS timeline. It has a bug tracker and built, so if you don't have one, you can just use that straight away. Um, one thing that track is missing is uh, burn down charts or time estimation. Uh, Fogbugs, which is, I think you can set up a, a free account for you know, if you have five users or something like that. Um, 
Flugbugs does time estimation for you. So basically, this is you put something in your bug track and you say, hey, for this bug, it'll take like, I'm giving it an estimate of five hours to fix. One general rule of thumb is that if you estimate anything <laughs> at more than two days, that means you haven't really thought about it hard enough, and your two day estimate is probably going to turn into like three weeks. Um, so break it down more. Just, you know, if it's a two day thing, it's going to be a pretty mammoth task, and you can always break it down to smaller chunks. And that will give you a good idea about how long it will take to fix things. Um, and then, based on this, your product manager can look at what the bugs that you've got left in the system and say, hey, you know, we are probably going to ship on this day, right? Which doesn't seem like that big a deal, but if you put it together with um, this idea that when you write software, there are only three variables that you can, that you can control for uh, when your software ships. Uh, and those variables are when's the shipping date, or you know, how much time is this going to take, what features do I want in there, and how long are they going to take to implement, and what kind of quality do you want for your software. If you add this feature, you know, is it going to be like, really nicely integrate with the rest of the program, or is it going to you know, just be this feel like more of a hacked out on thing? Um, and these are really the only things that uh, you can change. So given these three variables, you want to fix one or two of them. Right. Um, if you want to say, well, I am putting out version 2.0, it's going to have these new features in it, then you, the feature list that you have is fixed, which means that the only two things you can change are when it ships, or the time that it ships, and the quality of your software. Now, presumably, you want your software to be high quality, which really means that given your feature list and what you want to implement, there's only one thing that could move there, which is the date that it ships. Right. And you have to accept that, that if you're going to ship version 2 and it must have these features in there, then this is the only thing that, that can, if you want to keep that level of quality up, you don't have any other choice. But you know, if you're running, running behind, then it's going to get released late. Is that OK with you? It's most, for some people, it is. For some people, it's not. If you really need to ship by a certain date, then, you know, then that's fixed. And the features that you've got have, have got to be chopped out or the quality is going to suffer. So which one of those decisions are you going to make? Right? This is probably the most valuable slide in this entire presentation. So if there's one takeaway message from the whole thing, I would say it's, it's this. Right? And this was the most valuable thing I learned when I was working on this thing. Uh, all the stuff that I showed you before, burn-down charts, you know, they allow the communication to happen between the coder and the product manager, who might be yourself. But this, that allows the communication to happen so that you have a good idea of when you're going to ship <laughs> what bugs you have left, you know, what quality level you're at. So that's what everything really gives up to. Right? So in the end, it's all about making sure that you don't have to answer to your manager in a way that you don't want to. Um, keep, you, keep the communications channels open. Um, you don't want them checking in with you, you know, every, uh, every kind of couple of days, being annoyed that they don't have progress updates and stuff. And if you have the bug tracker, and if you have uh, burn down charts and all that, you know, they know. They don't need to ask you. And that's, that's good. They can look at it every day and adjust their schedules accordingly. So now let's talk about uh, a little bit more about the technology and code side of things. Um, Mac OS X comes with a lot of stuff to allow you to build apps. Um, Apple are great at producing these libraries that make our lives easier. Uh, you know, there's core image, there's core animation, there's core data, there's QuickTime. Um, but do you actually want to use these things? Um, you know, why would, first question is, why wouldn't you adopt these things considering that they supposedly make the lives easier? Especially since, you know, as software people, we've been taught to build big things out of smaller things. Um, reusable kind of building blocks, that's always been the goal of software engineering. Um, so build these complex systems out of smaller components. Uh, if Apple are giving you the parts to it, then why wouldn't you want to use them? Well, um, I kind of like this quote from Joel Spolsky. Uh, if you don't read his blog, it's a great blog to subscribe to. Uh, he writes in a very entertaining manner. You might not agree with everything he says, um, and I don't, but generally he's got a really good business sense. Um, and I think, I like this quote of his, if it's, if it's a really important core function of your product, write it yourself. Um, so if you are writing a, you know, a multimedia player, if you use QuickTime, then you're really bound by what QuickTime allows you to be able to do, uh, which in QuickTime's case is actually quite a lot. But for many other frameworks, it might not be the case. 
Um, you know, if you base your entire product around core animation, uh, you know, Little Snapper, when we do annotations and stuff on images, that all uses core animation. Um, you're completely restricted then by what Apple provides you, um, what Apple, what bugs are in there or not, and how much time it takes to work around them. So if it's something that's really important and really important for your product, um, I think it's usually a good idea to write it yourself, or at least have the source code to it. Um, open source is great here. Or if you can license a third party thing to do it for you, that's great. I mean, if you're writing, um, so one example is if you're writing you know, a database, do you use core data for it or not? You have to realize that if you use core data, you're really quite restricted in the operations you can do, right? And it just means that when a competitor rolls out a product, uh, a product to uh, a competitor rolls out something to your to your product, then um, how fast is your reaction time to that? You know, if Apple don't give you any new features in the next version of Core Data, is that okay? Like, do you sell your product based on um, those just those capabilities or stuff that sur that surrounds it? Right. So that's something to consider. Um, I know personally, I stayed away from Core Data for a very very long time. Uh, until basically it hit the iPhone, and it really did make building iPhone apps so much easier that I started adopting it. But before then, um, I didn't trust it enough, to be honest, because it was this closed code base, and your data is ultimately the most important thing for the user. And I didn't really feel good trusting core data to you know, the one essential thing um, that, my, that my application did, which is like saving and loading and making sure that uh, that'll work properly. Um, I had to work around some pretty interesting bugs in core data when it first came out when we worked on the little snapper and it cost us a lot of time so yeah be careful when evaluating new technologies and and especially if it's something for the core um, thing that your product does so as you keep on developing your product um, you don't really want customers yelling at you because you break things um, as i think a, a field we don't really know yet what the best way to, um, um, to build reliable software is. Um, it's still, you know, Objective-C is a very dynamic language and Cocoa is a very dynamic framework, which means that also that it's very hard to give guarantees about anything because at runtime, you know, lots of stuff could happen and this method might not exist anymore, it might exist, and you don't really know. Um, so right now, the best approach that we've got is actually testing. Um, and this is something that is always going to be much, much harder to write a test framework as you uh, evolve your product. So do it from the beginning or do it as soon as you can and it'll be a lot less painful. Um, and it's basically the only way I know of to ensure, of, to ensure that regressions don't happen. You, know, you don't want to ship a new version where this, fe this particular feature breaks. Um, if you make this part of your nightly builds, then you kind of don't have to worry about it put the testing framework in there and you know, the build bot will notify you when stuff breaks. Um, and you has to be automated because nobody ever runs these tests manually. Right? Uh, one tip I got from this is that if you write in some debugging code, you know, we all kind of do this and we all you know, drop into, uh, occasionally instead of using the debugger, you put in print statements here and there. Um, leave them in there sometimes and you know, intermingle with your code if it's not too horrible and just turn on a special, you know, you can use, uh, add a user default so that if they turn on something, if they set Boolean to yes, then suddenly it goes into debug mode and spews a lot of stuff to the console. Um, if you leave that code in there then uh, and you have a problem uh, with a customer, you can just email them back and say, hey, turn on this debugging mode for me and then you get access to all this other funky stuff and they go, oh, cool, like, I can explore all these other things in the app and it can give you more information about the problem. Right. So don't just put debugging code in there and then rip it out straight afterwards, which is what a lot of people tend to do. Um, so from a business perspective, it, the cross-platform idea is kind of a no-brainer because you ship on more platforms and you know, it allows you to sell more units. Um, the Windows market is, is gigantic. Um, I don't know what the exact how the shareware market on Windows works uh, versus the Mac, which I know much better. But the conversion rates actually seem to be almost pretty similar. Uh, Rogue Amoeba did a study when they put out Airfoil for Windows and the Mac, and maybe just because it's tied to an Apple product, the, um, the conversion factor for shareware was, was much higher than it uh, is for other Windows products. But you know, they got a lot of money from the Windows version of Airfoil. Um, one technical benefit you have to this, of course, is that uh, 
cross-platform software has to be architectured in such a way that you, know, you can actually write it cross-platform. So your code tends to get better if you try and make it cross-platform in the first place. Um, and plus, if you're not going to go cross-platform on this kind of stuff and go to write for Windows and Linux, you definitely probably want to go cross-platform on this if you can, because this is much more of a, you know, the platforms are so much more similar, even though the iPhone really is a different platform from the Mac, right? Um, we all know this now. When I first gave this talk, you know, the Omni Group were, were considering writing versions of their products for the iPhone and iPad, and we all know now that they've been highly successful at it, right? Technically, uh, you know, your code will improve if you do that and you have a common code base. Um, I'll be talking more about common code bases and stuff uh, in a little bit. So there's a great mailing list called MacSB for Mac Small Business. It's still around and it's still kicking. Um, this screenshot's from you know, 2008, but 2010, there's still many, many messages being passed around this list. If you are at all interested in the, in the commerce and business side of Mac software, um, I would highly recommend subscribing to it. So let's see, let's talk about support. Everybody loves doing this. Um, I think the one thing to keep in mind is that for every feature you add to your software and every bug that you fix, think about the support load that it's gonna cost you. Um, we have actively omitted many features from, from Rapid Weaver because we thought it would be a support nightmare, right? Rapid Weaver is a product which uh, has to work with a whole strange myriad of web servers <laughs> Um, the moment you put anything with server-side PHP in there, you know, half, half your bits are off and people have different PHP versions installed and all that. And yes, we could get it working and it would be cool to have it, but we just thought the support nightmare, is, it just totally kill, killed the whole idea. Right. So always keep that in the back of your mind when you're adding features to it. Um, I'm sure Mr. Gallagher here has had a really fun time trying to deal with all the you know, UPnP issues and stuff. And it's really cool that, that it all works, but you know, it's also a real pain. Right. So, um, I want to spend like a minute talking about licensing. Uh, everybody hates it. Um, we all don't like pirates, but you know, licensing. Honestly, it's an area where you can get really creative, and you can spend a lot of time, and you can put in lots of clever little anti-piracy things in your program. And you know, you're like, aha! If I can put another point in here and do a registration check and all this kind of stuff, you know, don't don't actually bother doing that. Don't spend as little time as you possibly can on licensing stuff. Um, it, this is for two reasons. One, you're, one, you're basically just wasting your time because people are going to pirate your stuff anyway. They're really the guys who hack the stuff are generally probably a lot better than you, um, and that's that's just a fact of life, and you have to accept that. So people are going to steal your stuff no matter whether you, whether you put really awesome licensing in it or not. Um, and the second thing is that if you keep it simpler, then it's more likely to work. Users tend to get really annoyed when they buy something and then the licensing fails for whatever reason, or you know it thinks it's still unregistered, right? Um, put the you know, it's an area where you, you can invest a lot of time and do it somewhere else. And you know, I know it can be beautiful, and you're like, yeah, I've got the most kick-ass like you know serial checking system in the world. You probably don't. All right, somebody's going to beat it anyway. Um, if you're looking for some licensing frameworks, Aquatic Pine was something that's fairly popular at the time, and I think it still is. Um, you can have a look at that. Uh, it's it's basically a license. It's like a little framework you can embed into your app um, that handles some licensing stuff for you, uh, and that works fine. You're you're really trying to stop your product from being, you know, pirated by the casual people rather than the hardcore hackers who are going to get around it anyway. Um, for online merchants, there's quite a few online merchants out there. All of them are pretty evil, and they take a pretty large cut, and they all kind of suck. Um, I'd recommend Accelerate. It was what uh, Real Mac used for a while. Uh, the only reason I recommend them is basically they give you this little lic licensing kit as well um, that you can put into your app. So they give you a library that you know can do online registration inside the application and do all, it's all nice and fancy. But also because a lot of other Mac developers use it and they understand the Mac developer crowd really well. So when you put in, if you ever have problems with them and you ask them about support, you know they can. Um, they can give you helpful answers because they've dealt with uh, a lot of Mac developers before. Um, they take a, what seems like a pretty huge cut, which, seems, which is 15% at the start. But you know, unless you're really willing to roll your own entire store and support that, you're probably not going to find that much burn in 15%. I mean, when you're selling, when you're selling um, your apps, this 15% versus 10%, if that 5% you know, that is not really that huge a difference in the long run, if that 5% is, is requiring you know, 
is, if that 5% is keeping you alive, that's probably not a good thing anyway, right? So I'd say you use this still, right? There's plenty of others. There's Kagi, there's, there's a, the Potion Factory stores, PayPal. Um, use kind of whatever is the least painful for you. One thing I can say is that uh, we're all coders here, um, but your website is probably the most important thing for all of your customers. It's the first, it is your image to the world, and it's what you project to, to everyone. Um, so get somebody professional to design it. You know, this was the old Real Mac software homepage, and this is what it looks like now. And you can tell it's designed by a guy who is like, not me, okay? Um, it, looks, it looks great, it's you know, really easily accessible, but more importantly, this is the image you project to your company. You know, it looks so professional, and it looks like this. This is, what, this is the kind of software that, that we build. You know, it looks and feels beautiful. Um, for the stuff I worked on with CineSync, you can have a look at that site, and it's not as good. And uh, one other guy and, and myself built this site in, the, in a couple of days. And you know, I think the design's okay. It's functional, but it ain't nothing like this, right? But a CineSync site works, and it works partially just because it was targeted <clears throat> at a very particular niche industry. Um, so spend some time anyway in getting um, somebody professional to design at least your logo. If you look at the CineSync logo up there, which is the triangular thing, it actually reflects the product very, very, very well. But that, your logo and your application icon is your application for many, many customers. So make a good one. If you spend $1,000 on it, you know, it's probably going to reflect, you know, that $1,000 you spend on it is not going to be that much concern in the long run um, because it's what people actually really think of your app. And maybe the $1,000 have resulted in a lot more sales. You don't really know. Uh, so this is one slide I updated for this. Um, from a business point of view and a support point of view, use a crash reporter. Um, Apple, you know, Apple's crash reporter unfortunately still doesn't give you and the developer the information, the stack trace or anything useful like that. It tells Apple that this app is crashing a lot and that's it. Um, if you use a crash reporter, then you'll, you'll find out about all the crashes out there in the field, and more importantly, you can go fix it. Um, so the first time we integrated this into Rapid Weaver, we were literally getting like 30 or 40 crash reports per day, right? And we were just all really, just like, oh my god, really? This is this bad? Um, and it was kind of depressing. And then it depressed us more that this was probably carrying on for the, you know, since the beginning of the time that Rapid Weaver got released, and we didn't know that it was crashing this bad. Um, and this at least allows you to fix up the bugs with it. Um, these days, you know, PL Crash Report is great. Uh, it works on the Mac and iPhone. So it works for both platforms that, uh, that we're concerned about here. Um, but yeah, get one, and it at least allows you to fix things up. Um, at Pixar, one of our current vendors who supplies us the color grading software, they don't have a crash reporter. And believe me, that software crashes a lot, and we get very frustrated when we know that we can't give them any feedback for how to fix the thing, right? The engineers are kind of just, they don't even know that this stuff is happening. Um, so yeah, try and get one, and users are always amazed, especially if, uh, if you get the crash reports directly and you can get the email address somehow, or they're willing to put it in there. If you email them saying, hey, you know, I think I fixed this crash, try out this new version, they're just stoked, they become your best friends after that because they're just amazed that the software company actually noticed something and fixed it for them and usually they become champions for your software after that. So from that business perspective, it's great. Um, make sure you use an automatic application updater. Um, <laughs> just again, once again, this cut down on the support. We were amazed at the number of people who are running older versions and um, you know, they're like they're running 4.0 and 4.1 came out. I'm like, well, have you? Are you running 4.1? They're like, no. I'm like, well, you probably want to try that because we fixed the exact bug that you're having. And they're like, oh, really? And then they go and update it, and it's all fine. And that was just you know, an hour of back and forth dialogue between people that was could have been used to do something else. So again, this is just really designed to try and lower your support. Um, apart from that, you can also use it to gather anonymous statistics about your users as well. And that's obviously great to try and figure out what platform you should be targeting and are people really on, all on Snow Leopard now or you know, do you have a lot of older users in Enterprise or, or whatnot. Um, so yeah, you can make sure you use Sparkle. It's super easy to integrate into your project. Um, 
there's no reason why you shouldn't be doing it, and it'll cut down your support costs quite a lot. Um, for error handling, this is a, you know, error handling is probably the most unfun part of programming. It sucks to do, but if you don't get it right, you will always pay for it later when a thousand copies of your software goes out to users and they run it on the most bizarre systems you can ever think of that you know, have quick time missing or something like that. Right? Don't check every single system call uh, all the time. Um, make sure you check every single NS error that comes back and adjust your code so that you, know, you fake the error being thrown so you can actually see what happens and make sure that the error handling code itself doesn't crash because that happened to, to me a couple of times. Right? So actually execute all that code and make sure you get code coverage and all, and all the parts of the code that rarely ever runs or you know, is never meant to run. Because um, yeah, when you ship 1,000 or 10,000 copies of this, you will encounter some really weird situations where something is going to get screwed up. And you know, that part of the code that never ever runs gets run and says, hey, you know, you're missing like, this essential thing in your file system or whatnot. And so now let's talk about uh, refactoring, which I think is a, something that is, appeals to us really on a, you know, on a coding level, but um, also it has a huge, huge business impact. Um, refactoring is just when you take you know, a total mess of everything like this and you turn it into that. And it's all pretty and beautiful. And everybody loves doing this. You know? uh, how many times have we told you know, managers and whatnot that, you know, well, I'm going to spend a week or two just refactoring this. And then I'll move on to this awesome new feature because it'll be so much easier to do it. And all the managers are always like, uh-huh, sure you will. Um, but yeah, it is a really hard decision to make. Um, I would say that <laughs> instead of refactoring, think back to your forefathers of like Nuth and Dextro and stuff and just get it right the first time. Right? This is the same as the whole error handling thing. Um, how many, if you worked on a, a larger product or anything that's shipped, how many, you know, if you grep for to do or fix me in your code, how many times have you ever have you seen that? And it's still sitting there. It's not even your bug tracker, but it's like a to do or fix me. Oh, you know, I'll get to this one day. Right? Just pay the effort and just go and go down and do it. And you know, I'll, I will quite frequently do this and really grumble about it. And my workmates know exactly what's going on because you know they're like, I have to go through all this pain and just to support this one stupid thing. But um, the other choice is that you know you're going to have to fix it later. And fixing it later is always tends to be more painful. Um, so yeah, try and get it right the first time. But back to refactoring. Um, there's this question about well refactorings and and rewrites. Um, Netscape, well, Firefox is a very, very successful product these days, but people forget that it took years, I mean, years for it to come out, right? Netscape um, at the time was, you know, the, the browser. Um, nobody, we didn't use anything else, um, and they decided to rewrite it from scratch. Well, that was a clever idea. <laughs> Netscape kind of died, they ended up open, open sourcing Firefox. Um, and then finally, I think about three years later or something, after they put the first bits of open source code out there, it finally went to 1.0. So rewriting it was, well, it ended up okay now, but maybe they could have saved themselves and you know, had done much better in market share uh, if they didn't decide to rewrite it. All right. um, this is a pretty hard question, business-wise. You know, if you're refactoring or rewriting, then your product is standing completely still. Right, especially if you are the only code on a project, project, then you know the feeling of if you have a bad day and the code, you know, in this, this feature you're trying to implement, if you don't get it quite right, then basically your entire day is not wasted, but your product hasn't moved in that time at all. Right? And it's, you don't want to have this feeling for two weeks where your product's exactly the same. I mean, code-wise, it might be nicer, but feature-wise and you know what you can sell to people, they don't they don't really care. So you don't want to be in this position of, for one or two weeks. Um, if you rewrite something, then obviously it's, it's much, much more mammoth. Um, that said, you can do rewrites. If you're Iron Man, go do a rewrite. Right? Um, one of, when we worked on CineSync, so one of the most interesting things about it was that I worked on it with this guy, a um, good friend of mine, Jeffrey Lim. Um, he's done rewrites before, and he knows what's involved. So if you have somebody who's really experienced with do, re actually doing a rewrite, and I mean doing a rewrite on a, on a shipping product from scratch, go and do it. But you really want somebody who knows and has done it before and can 
you know, implement every single thing that was in your old product to try and fix up all those stupid cases where users, you know, have, were missing this or was, you know, they're running in French and this didn't work. Um, all those kind of stuff you lose in the rewrite. So um, I think it's a, it is okay to rewrite it. And for Cinesync 1.0, uh, well, we released 1.0, um, and that was a completely different code base for the Windows and Mac. We had Windows and Mac versions at the time. 1.0.1 uh, was actually a complete rewrite of the Mac version using the Windows code base. So now we had a, a cross-platform thing. But in terms of the feature list, you know, it was released as 1.0.1, not 2.0, because the feature list was kind of the same for most users. But we figured at that point that it was just really bad having two completely disparate code bases for the Windows and Mac versions, and we should really unify the core logic into something that, um, that we could use on both platforms. So we had a common C++ core um, with Objective-C and native Objective-C interface on the Mac and WX widgets on Windows, right? But it's a really hard business question. Um, do you want to go and do you want to spend the time to refactor stuff? You know, I can't. This is not something where you can just say yes or no, and you've got to look at each situation by itself. Um, so the, basically, the, the big question is, you know, consider the business impact of everything that you do. Every single bit of line of code that you add or remove, what's the support cost of it? Is this going to actually going to affect the bottom line? Um, I suspect most of us here will be independent developers, and that's it's a great thing to try and keep in your head all the time. Um, you know, honestly, the support burden is the thing that's probably going to kill you. Um, so try and minimize that, and do everything you possibly can so that you don't have to do support. If it takes you five hours, you know, to I don't know, make a nicer uh, error message or error handle something more gracefully, then you know maybe that's about 50 hours that you saved of you know email support for that. Right. So, um, one message I want to get across from this is that you know you are part of this team, um, and you do work in a greater context. You know, there's marketing people, uh, which may or may not be you, but you know, as a coder, code is it's still your domain, right? And you are still the best person to have the judgments about the code. I love this quote from uh, Patrick Logan: um, "Developers, and especially development managers, tend to be pushovers." Uh, to, I, believe this to, to, I believe this to be so to a large extent because they don't have a high enough regard for the principles of their craft. If you're a developer working with an overbearing business person, it's your responsibility to stand up for the system and make the case for the consequences of bad decisions past and present. Right? Um, and nobody understands the code better than you. Uh, that's why you're, you know, you're writing it. Uh, if your product manager is you know, saying to you, yeah, I think we should do a refactor, I think we should not do a refactor, you must, you must be able to be, you must be the person to be able to confidently answer that question and say, yes, I think we should do it, and it's for these, these reasons here, right? So you're still that person, but just do keep the business aspect of it in mind. Um, <laughs> I actually have to thank Nick Fletcher, um, who was my comrade at RealMac. He's actually staying in my place in San Francisco at the moment because uh, I actually totally forgot to put this talk onto my laptop before I uh, flew over here. And so Nick actually went, had to go to my place and copy it into Dropbox so I could get it onto this laptop. So um, yeah, otherwise this presentation would be a little bit different without any of the slides on it. Um, so this is a pretty short talk, and that's really all I had to say about that. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions at this point, but I'm not quite finished yet. So uh, any questions at the moment? Yeah. Um, the only code coverage tools that I know are more the geeky Unix ones, like GCov. Um, for Cocoa, I'm not. Does anybody else here know about Cocoa code coverage tools at all? Uh, I don't, unfortunately. Um, sorry, if you don't know what code coverage is, it's, it's basically how much of my code is being executed. So if you have a test, uh, if you have 100% code coverage, that means every single branch of your code, you know, if statements and all that, all of it's being executed. And that very, that's where you want to get to. And very, very few projects have 100% code coverage. Um, mostly it's more like the 70 to 80% range where you test most of the core functionality of the app. And so you exercise 80% of the code, and the other 20%, you know, you should keep writing tests and stuff to try and exercise that. Uh, but I don't know of any code coverage tools for the Mac, unfortunately. Can you tell us about Cinesync? Or is that No, that, uh, I left the company a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, it's being developed by Rising Sun now. But 
it's still the only thing in the market, which is great. So there's one more thing. Um, as kind of just a bonus, because uh, I knew the, the talk was a little bit short, um, I thought maybe, you know, I'd be giving, I've given two talks now without a single line of code in them, and I thought this wasn't right. <laughs> so let's start looking at some, at some actual example code and seeing here, are, and this is a section on the best tips I ever learned on writing better code, right? So let's have a look at this. Hope, can you all read that at the back, hopefully? Um, this is some code that, you know, it uses POSIX APIs, which, so it's not, it's not all nice and cocoa-y, but you kind of need to do this to, uh, to get the job done in, in this context. Uh, so here's some code. Um, arguably, it's not too bad. It's somewhat clear. You know, you can have issues with the coding style and stuff, and everybody has their own style, whatever. Um, but it's not too bad. You know, it's got some comments and, and all that, and it seems like it's reasonably readable, right? So the... The two best tips I ever learned um, for improving your code is, the first one is if you feel the need to comment a block of code, move that code into a different function and name the function well. Um, the second best tip I ever learned was, don't, was make sure you don't use, try not to use abbreviations for anything. Because then you have to think about, you know, you have to pause in your brain what the abbreviation is and then it can become ambiguous what, you know, should you abbreviate number to NO or NUM, that kind of stuff. Um, use Coco is we're really lucky because Coco is actually a framework that encourages um, verbosity, right? And long, long, long method names. You know, this is one awesome method name in NS, NS Image. I think it's like 300 characters long. It's you know, all the alloc in it with bit planes and you know, and and all this other kind of stuff. But it's like th literally 300 characters long. But you know exactly what it does when you when you look at it, right? And that's the important thing. Um, because we write code once and we read it many, many, many times, and people always forget this, right? If you are sick of typing long stuff, get a better, get a better editor. Xcode's pretty good. The code completion now, especially, is pretty good. So long variable names and stuff, you know, it's it shouldn't bother you. If it does, your editor's not uh, not doing its job. So I would say we can refactor that into that, and so your main method now becomes it's totally clear what that that function is doing now. Sets so the maximum number of file descriptors to 512. And then the code all goes in there. And sure, there's a lot of you know, weird system call -y, you know, POSIX stuff going on inside. But you know, that function is what, now six lines long or something? And you can, you know, it's easy to tear apart now. Um, and if you go back and, and you look at, well, if you look at each of the variable names there, it's very clear what they're actually trying to represent, right? Get our limit, get, sorry, set our limit return value. That's the return value from the set our limit call. And if you look at that line in isolation, you know exactly what it does, as opposed to saying ca calling something status, which is pretty common, or you know, ret val for a lot of people use ret val for return value, um, or just you know, kind of taking shortcuts on these names. I've seen tons and tons of code that just call these little temporary things in there that you know you only need them for five or six lines. They just call them r or i or you know something that's abbreviated form. And I have to sit there and like, I've seen like PO and stuff a lot. And I'm like, what does that mean? Right? Spell it out. So don't use abbreviations and put stuff into its own function if you feel the need to comment it. Uh, then you can remove the comment. And then you can no longer have this problem of the comments being out of sync with what the code actually does. Um, I worked with a coder once. And I thought this was wonderful at the time. He literally commented every single line of code that he had. So, you know, it was 100 lines long. He'd, it would be 50 lines of actual code and 50 lines of comments. And I thought it was, it was awesome at first because I could just read the comments. And I realized that if you just read the comments, you don't, it might not actually match what the code does. Okay, comments are always meant to try and explain, you know, why you're doing something, not how to do it. Um, so that was the single best tip that I found. Um, one other thing that I would encourage is use, uh, I have these macros that expand out to stuff that looks like that. Um, these big, big long lines of just, you know, comments and basically code is typography. Use visual separators in it because it's so much easier to read. You know, I've seen tons and tons of Cocoa classes where it's all just, you know, method declaration body, method declaration body, and there's no um, separation between any of those things, even though, you know, maybe like in Xcode you tend to use the pragma mark stuff a lot. Um, to mark like, you know, this is my delegate method sections for, you know, this particular protocol or something. But if you use the visual separators, believe me, it makes the code a ton easier to read. There is, especially if you don't have syntax highlighting like on this slide. Um, 
So one of my pet peeves, this is not Objective-C, it's Shell, but one of my pet peeves is seeing stuff like this, and I see it a lot as well. Um, code that's four or five or six or seven, I think once I, I counted the amount of tabs at the start in Rapid Weaver code, I think I was like, it was like 18 levels deep or something ridiculous like that. You know, you couldn't even see the thing until, see the line of code until you got to column 140 on the screen, right? Um, so a lot of people love doing this because they think putting in multiple returns um, or something inside a function is evil. Like you don't, you know, a lot of people believe that you, your function should just exit at the end and that's your one exit point. But then you, if you do that, you have to set up these state variables, all this other stuff, and it's like, you know, just exit out of it if you need to. So here, it basically just ex you just restructure the loop. Oh, sorry, not the loop. You restructure the conditionals so that um, it actually just exit it, exits out early. Right? There's nothing wrong with it. Right? Use your own judgment on stuff. If you have to do cleanup and all that, then you know, then it gets a little bit more tricky. But you know, you can. There are other alternatives to that as well. Like uh, you can use try finally or something of that sort. Um, use blank lines as separators. Again, code is type typography, and I see so much code written that's just this. 100 lines all put together with no, separate, no spacing between them is much harder to read than if you group it into logical things. You know, here it's just like, well, you have conceptually you know, three different things that, uh, that you're doing here, and so why not separate it out into different sections? Um, one thing that's specific to Objective-C, um, I try and use this pattern in more modern code. Uh, Objective-C 2 has you know, great stuff for doing for accesses and all that, but it's pretty, still pretty common that you want to have something that's treated like a, like a property, um, but you actually have to do, so, you know, when you do a get or a set of it, you have to do something with the property before you hand it back to the class that's asking for it, uh, or you, know, you have to verify it before you set it. Um, so what I tend to do with this is, uh, in your public interface, you, know, you, you declare a property with your public property in there, and then in your, and you can use a class continuation, which is that interface my class in parentheses, single parentheses thing. Um, that basically says, hey, you know, continue defining this stuff for this class. It's kind of like a category, except it's just unnamed. Um, so you can, so then you have a separate actual, you know, the backing store, the instance variable, or that particular property um, that where the real data is getting stored. But then you just implement the pub, your public getters and setters um, to do something with you know, your private store. And then you can verify if you need to do any um, checking or transformation on it before you hand the value back. Um, you can do that. So it's just a little useful design pattern I've learned and started using a couple of years ago. Um, I've actually seen this. Uh, this happened in a rap Rapid Weaver code once. Um, somebody, this is, uh, it's in a bigger context of. Um, Originally, this slide, I had a, basically a big thing saying, uh, dictionaries are not objects. Um, and this, so what they did was, uh, you know, well, they basically wanted something that was like an object. So here, like, if you imagine that this is meant to be uh, an object that stores a blog entry, so it has a title, a body, a you know, date posted, all that kind of stuff. Um, they actually defined the category on NS Dictionary uh, that had these convenient accesses like title and date and all that. And then, you know, they could just treat this thing like, an object and just use these title and date methods and stuff to get information out of it. Um, this is all fine until, well, it's actually not fine at all, but it gets even worse when you have something, when you keep on doing this a lot and you have clashing names for things and the keys that you use to store stuff tend to be different. So we had, I think there, was, there were two methods they had on NS Dictionary called title and they were accessing different keys in the dictionary and when you do that, the runtime just decides to choose one over the other. So, and it's completely random which one it actually chooses. So it ended up breaking on, I don't know, 5% of user systems. And it took a really, really long time to figure out what was going on. Um, but this comes in the context of, you know, if you make actual objects, um, goes back to trying to, to doing it right the first time. Don't make it dictionaries. I know why you want to make it dictionaries because you don't want to implement all that stupid uh, NS copying protocol and NS coding and all that other stuff. Um, I wrote a class a while ago called RM model object, which um, allows you to do this. If you want an object that basically just holds data and you want it to have copying behavior and NS coding behavior so you can archive, unarchive it, get copy paste, all that kind of stuff, you can subclass from our model object, and this is all you need to write for it. 
you know, it's basically a very, very simple store for all these values, but it gives you the uh, behavior you would expect from model objects, right? Which is the reason why most people fall back to using NS Dictionary in the first place, because it gives them that behavior for free. So this does allow you to do the same thing, and then everything is typed and structured. Um, I think the only situation where you should be using dictionaries is if it's actually dynamic. So you read and stuff from a plist at runtime, or you know the user can add uh, certain keys and stuff to it. And that's really, in all other situations, you should really be using proper classes to represent data. Um, one other small tip I learned was that uh, in conditionals, positive language is generally is usually better. Um, you know, it's it's much more difficult to parse stuff in a negative. Right, so in all my if statements, you know, is like what's a, what's a good example? Um, so Coco does it really well when with uh, Windows have a is hidden um, property, I think, where you can access you know whether whether Windows hidden is not. It's not you know it's in contrast to that you should also have something with, that says whether the window is visible, because if you read something that says no you know not is hidden, like. It takes you a second to try and f to figure out. Oh, that's actually negating this, and you know, oh, I really want to figure out whether the window is visible on screen or not. Um, so quite often, I supply you know dual um, properties that allow you to that just negate the other state, so that um, you can use them in conditionals and use it in a positive um, conditional manner rather than trying to you know put knots in front of things to test for things. Um, so that's probably about it. Um, any more questions at all? Cool. Well, thank you.